What's up, guys? It's Liz Kelly. The NFL trade deadline was on Tuesday, and The Ringer has tons of coverage up on the site. We have everything you need to know, including Danny Kelly on the winners and losers, and Kevin Clark on why the trade deadline is more fun than it's ever been. You can check it out on TheRinger.com. Welcome to the Ringer NBA Show. I'm Kevin O'Connor, and we are the Corner Three. Joining me here in beautiful Los Angeles is Ringer Associate Editor Danny Chow. I'm feeling great right now. I'm wearing this uh, Slam Magazine Vince Carter t-shirt. Feeling? It's, it's beautiful. Feeling great, looking great. It's a beautiful shirt. And from Dallas, Texas, it's Ringer Staff Writer John Sharks. What's up, guys? We're recording this at 2 p.m. on Thursday, which means last night was Halloween. Do you guys do anything? Nope. I was uh, grinding tape, uh, editing stories. Yeah. Hell yeah. You know? There we go. <laughs> How about you, John? <laughs> no, I was definitely not grinding tape. That's uh, I just come with takes. They're not very well grounded usually. Um, me and my wife, I was Han Solo. She was Princess Ooh. Leia. Our cat was Yoda. It was pretty sweet. Awesome. I dig that, man. I dig that. I, I was uh, dressed last night with my date at Adam's Family coordinated outfits. We went to the Mac Miller Celebration of Life show. Had an extraordinary oh, cool. time there. So John Mayer, Chance the Rapper. SZA, Travis Scott. You know, honestly, that show is a, a beautiful tribute. It was really emotional. Can you see, let's not bury the lead. You went no. as a couple <laughs> on your, in the South. Yeah, Come sure. on. Anyway, today's podcast is produced by Bobby Wagner. Bobby, did you do anything for Halloween? No, I was just grinding away, editing at two pods, you know? Jeez. Doing my job. That's horrifying. Yeah, some spooky stuff right there. Yeah, very spooky. Very yeah, spooky. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I kind of got Halloweened out. I think a year or two ago, me and my friends all wanted to go as, you know, the Scooby-Doo gang. The only problem was we all realized that we all wanted to be Velma. And so all of us dressed up as Velma. And so we were just a what? gang of like five Velmas. <laughs> there are pictures of me in the full orange turtleneck, red skirt. It's a little, it's a little terrifying, but I will gladly share if you guys are Please. interested. So Please, Danny. My, that, that, that was when I peaked in Halloween. So it's all about finding the right roles in your squad, man. Can I five Velmas? Or, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Uh, I can see why you're Halloweened out at this point. But anyway, we're recording this at 2 p.m., like I said, on a Thursday, which means we're not going to be able to react to Thursday night's games. But there is plenty to talk about, including the sputtering Houston Rockets, a team that many expected to perhaps match what they did last season, a 60-plus win team, or at least reach 50 wins. But so far this season, the Rockets are 1-5. 1-5! One in five. One in five. Um, really struggling on both ends of the floor. Bottom 10 offense and defensive rating so far this season. And they just don't look anything like themselves, do they, Danny? No. I, I mean, if you look at their average margin of victory, or I guess in this case, average margin of losses. Margin of defeat. Yeah, yeah it's negative 10.5. They're not just losing. They're getting yeah. smoked. It's not like the Lakers lo- losing a lot of cl- close games. The Rockets are just getting smoked. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the thing, right? When I think over the summer, uh, Daryl Morey was like, oh, he was responding to all of the naysaying about you know, the the lack of moves or or the lack of, you know, important moves. And he was just like, well, the most important thing we could have had was Chris Paul getting healthy again. And yet, where are we now? Where are we with, with these Rockets? And that's part of the issue, isn't it, John, that, you know, you do have Chris Paul back, but James Harden at this time has a hamstring injury. And for someone like him, whenever he comes back, um, part of that stop on a dime ability, whether it's, you know, juking past the defender or pulling up from three, it's not you need your hamstrings, and I worry long term for them if he's not able to get back to the same James Harden. I mean, yeah, they can't rush him back. No, no matter how bad they are right now, he's too important. And like even even James Ennis, like this team is not deep. That's what really <laughs> jumped out to me watching them. They're playing like Isaiah Hardenstein, who even knows that is Malik Carter Williams, Gerald Green. Like this is not an NBA caliber bench, right? Yeah, ultimately, right now. Their defensive communication is bad. And it seems like oftentimes the only guy that's playing hard is P.J. Tucker, which isn't a surprise that he is, but they're not rebounding. Clint Capella is getting pulled away from the rim, not really rebounding at the same level he has in the past. I mean, he got his fat contract, man. Mm. You know, everyone's sitting yeah. free in here. I don't know if it's that <laughs> as much as just like, it's the team is just a mess right now. And Carmelo Anthony, I mean, I wrote an article last month in The Ringer about how let's leave this a chance, right? Maybe a new situation for Melo, rejuvenated. Maybe this helps him. In are are you taking that back, KFC? Oh, is that what's happening? Like, he is so washed. You he know, is done. Here's what the great Stephen A. Smith had to say about this topic oh, that was good. a few days ago. Carmelo Anthony is bad. He's Steve, bad. Stephen A. nailed it. What's interesting to me is 
last year, the Rockets had such a defined style of play. Mm-hmm. It, and it relied on very specific individual players to basically thrive in their roles on either end of the floor. You had Chris Paul, you had Harden and Gordon being largely the only playmakers on the team. And on the opposite end, you had Ariza and Luke Bob Mute, who are like genius defenders for their positions, figuring it all out on the fly in this switch-heavy defense. You lose those two guys, and suddenly you're looking at the death chart, and you're like, how do we even recreate this? It's like John said earlier, you're relying on Isaiah Hartenstein. You're relying on James Ennis, and I don't think James Ennis has necessarily been horrible. He's just not He hasn't played that much. He's been injured. He just hasn't been Trevor Ariza. And Trevor Ariza was a really important player for that team last year. Ultimately, though, Carmelo Anthony, I think, is the primary reason why. Because teams are just targeting him. Every single time he's on the floor, they're going after Carmelo Anthony. Because he can't defend on the perimeter. But didn't they do that with Ryan Anderson last year? I mean... But he's been even worse than Ryan Anderson, I think. I really do. I mean, and that's that's saying a lot. I guess that's fair, but man, that is... (laughs) And ultimately, just collectively, the, the effort on that end of the floor is just not there. It's just not there at all. It's it's really incredible. Like when I was looking at the Carmelo signing over the offseason, I was just like, all he needs to do is fill Ryan Anderson's role. For us to say mm. he can't be Ryan Anderson, that's that's dark. Yeah, but here's the thing though. Anderson had Ariza, Mamba Mute, Tucker around him, right? right? They had like guys who could hide him on defense. And those guys are gone now. Let's just call a spade a spade. They got a new owner. He didn't want to pay these guys. Now we're seeing the result of that. I have mixed feelings on that, John. I think with Ariza, he got overpaid for one year by Phoenix. And then with Ba Mute, he, his shoulder injuries, you know, may, maybe they decided ultimately it wasn't in the best interest to bring him back, go with some younger options, and try to, you know, go with an upside player in Carmelo Anthony. And so far, it just has not worked one bit. He's even more of a downside player, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I was, mean, <laughs> yeah, you, I guess if you're Daryl Morey, you really just, you know, all the talk last year about risk profiles, you really just have to take that swing if there's even, you know... No, see, I think he just has owners who don't pay for his players. What's he going to say? Like, my owner's cheap? He's not going to say that. So he has to give you cook up some nonsense stuff to tell, tell the media. I think the one interesting thing with Houston is they're still doing very well in isolations, right? They're scoring 1.2 points per possession on isolations, which is pretty similar to last season. It's just everything else. They're not shooting the ball well. No, Nobody is shooting the ball well on that team at all. They're just not scoring well in transition either. So it's Part of it is like, okay, let's give it time and see if this offense starts clicking. But ultimately, it's the defense that's the difference. Yeah, I mean, to me, if they can get two, three, and D, six foot eight wings, they'll be in pretty good shape. <laughs> well, <laughs> where are they coming I mean, from? Where, where are they coming from? <laughs> where will those guys be? I don't know. <laughs> it, you know, it, is there any solving this, Danny? I mean, at this point, I am looking at that Jimmy Butler trade, whatever. Wh- what was the offer? What what was the last reported offer that they, I, I they think, had on the table? I think so. When it was reported, that was four first-round picks. And then Marquise Chris and Brandon Knight, who was done. Uh-huh. Um, it's two players who aren't worth anything, right? right? I, I think what I heard is that it could also just be three first-round picks. Okay. Um, but I wonder if maybe that's like a... a sliding offer depending on what the player is in the deal. If you're giving a better player, then maybe you can only get two picks or you can only get three picks. Ultimately... See, it seems to me like there has to be a three-way deal though, right? Because Tib doesn't want picks. That's just not going to happen. Well, I mean, and that's why the deal is probably not going to happen with Houston. Right. I would be surprised if Houston ends up landing Jimmy Butler compared to what either one of the other teams that have been reported, whether it's a team like the Clippers, if they want to hop back in, or even a team like Dallas, if they want to hop in, or anybody else, Miami, they can do better for what Minnesota wants. It's It's as if... Unless Glenn Taylor steps in and is like, we're going to take a forward, forward-thinking forward look at this trade, and we're going to take a lot of picks from Houston, maybe with mineral, mineral protections as well. So basically, I, I had heard you know some stuff about Gordon and Tucker at various points in, in these talks being included or not being included. If they were included, would you do a, a Butler trade? I would give up Gordon in a trade. I, w- I would give up Gordon probably with two first-round draft picks. I think that's fair. And if, I, if I'm Minnesota, that has to be appealing. Eric Gordon's a really, really good player. Right. He really is. He would help that. He would help that. No Absolutely. doubt about it. I, I think Gordon, it granted, his free agency is coming up, and he turns 30 on Christmas this year. Um, yeah, I, I, I still really like his game and think he would be a fit for Minnesota. I, I would personally rather go the younger route sure. if I'm the Wolves, but it doesn't seem like they want to do that. They want to continue trying to build. And why wouldn't you? You have Carl Anthony Towns. You have a lot of money invested into Andrew Wiggins. Ultimately, that's what you're going for in a right. deal. I think if you can find that balance, though, it could be good. 
I think for Houston, if you want to aim a little lower, maybe someone like Jonathan Simmons, Kent Bazemore, like just get some three and D guys. They, those guys can probably got for one first round pick, and that could actually happen. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure the Hawks are definitely amenable to to trading Bazemore. He's certainly been on the trading block for feels like two years now. I mean, the Rockets almost signed him what two years ago. If, yeah. if we're being real though, do these guys move the needle at all for them? No, they don't. Yeah, right? They gives, well, gives them defensive players. Yeah, I think yeah. you still have Harden and Paul, and you put the defense around them. Yeah, and if Capella too. If you're going off the premise that basically all the Rockets needed last year was just to be healthy, and and if you can just recreate what they did last year with a few more so defenders, you're saying Chris Paul gets back to being Chris Paul, James Harden stays healthy and gets back to become the MVP caliber player that yeah. he was last and year, and then you get a, and then you get guys like you know Bazemore, Marvin Williams, who who knows, but ooh Marvin Williams makes a good name too, too. Guy, yeah guys like that who you know can defend multiple positions, shoot the three, and then suddenly who knows you know the Rockets were really really good last year. Yeah, I mean, let's stop forget about the Warriors. Let's get back to the playoffs right now. We have Harden, we have Paul. We get to the playoffs, something can happen. But we got to get back to the playoffs. We got to get some defense in there. That, that's that's the key thing is with this really really slow start and yeah. some tough games coming up as well. Um, what's been bad so far could get worse for Houston, but I wouldn't give up on them yet. Uh, with the shooting, it, ha- it hasn't been where it has where it needs to be yet. Ultimately, though, it's the defense that concerns me. Um, we'll find out over the course of time whether that pans out for them. The other team, it's probably in worse shape. Way worse shape. Washington Wizards. It's just KOC's favorite time of year. We're already <laughs> in uh, blow it up mode. Blow it up! Oh, man. Yeah, yeah it's... Um, I don't want to say long overdue for Washington because the backcourt obviously has significant potential with Beal and Wall. Um, but the rest of that team is just not working, Danny. I mean, right. they might be the most dysfunctional thing in D.C. right now. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Whoa. That is a take. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that that's is some, a take. That's some spice for NBA desktop, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> that spice is really hot, John. How long did you? How long did you have yeah. to set that up? Yeah, that, you, that was that was beautiful. Were you sitting on that? No, I, it just came to me. I was just thinking about it. I was reading the Ringer's coverage of politics today, and I was like, you know what? The Wizards are pretty bad too. <laughs> where do we start with Washington, Danny? They have so many issues. I don't know where to start. I don't either. Mainly because, <laughs> look, they have to make a trade. I'm assuming, but at the same time, what what do you trade? They're they're locked into this salary cap hell for the next yeah. three years. If you trade away Otto Porter for, I mean, first of all, who's <sighs> going to be taking Otto Porter at 26 million at the production he's he's going at? Like, I've got a can name you get, for you. Can you get a fair trade with that? I've been saying for a while, Harrison Barnes for Otto Porter. The Mavs would do that. I think. You think the Mavs would do that? Otto Porter fits more with Luka because Harrison's an mm. ISO player. Otto's more of a True. ball mover, better defensively. I'm into that. And I think Harrison Barnes, high character guy, the senator goes to DC. Senator Barnes, you know, I don't know. <laughs> He's when he opened his contract. That dude's not fixing the entire locker room. Though. Yeah, that's what well, I, but he clears he clears cap space though, and he gives you a good player for with, with, while clearing your space a bit. He does help clear cap space, but ultimately for this team right now, it just seems like a lot of me, me, me. Otto Porter taking shots early in the shot clock. Austin Rivers, Markeith Morris, guys who traditionally like taking their shots when they have an opportunity. Right now, I mean, <laughs> Dwight Howard is supposed to come back Friday night. And I, Ooh. I, I, Ooh. I, I, yeah, exactly. However, however, I realize I'm going to get myself in trouble here just like I did with Carmelo Anthony, but maybe Dwight can help. He, they, they rank last. Mm. In defensive rebounding, right. their room protection is non-existent. I mean, Maybe they're Dwight horrible can help. right now. They are horrible. But KOC, embrace your inner bomber. Let's trade Waller Beal and get this thing moving. Well, well right? before, That's before we get to like just detonating the team, like you do need to see how it looks with Dwight Howard. Maybe, maybe just having a defensive rebounder helps. Maybe sure. having a little bit extra room protection helps. I mean, it gets him back to like 500 maybe, but I don't know. You it, know it, at some point, let's, let's do something different. It doesn't change the fact that they don't have an identity offensively. It doesn't change the fact their defensive communication is just horrific. Those guys don't really talk out there. Right. Um, there's a long list of issues on this team, and you're right, John. There might need to be a change that's made. I remember two years ago, one of the first things— Yeah, you reported that. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, that was a good article. Two years ago, I, I wrote something on The Ringer just reporting about how like Wall and Beal aren't best friends. You know, That's just part of it. Like Wall wasn't happy about Beal's contract, and Wizards fans understand we weren't happy about that, but it was true. And those guys can coexist. You can coexist with people and you know, be playing on a team when you're not best friends. And you know, I looked back at that article this morning, and there's this quote from Nene I had at the end. In 2013, Nene said, quote, Our young guys must take their heads out of their butts and play <laughs> the right way because I'm getting tired of this. 
And so five, 2013, oh yeah, my God. 2013, right. five years have passed now, and we're having <laughs> these same chemistry issues on Washington. So if you're the front office, maybe you need, do need to pull the plug and change something on this team. I think as a, as a, as a site, we've been ahead of the curve on this. Like Chris Almeida, one of our uh, editors. Shout out to Chris. Yeah, he's, he's been on this, on this train for years now. He had a piece that was titled very mm-hmm. simply, very effectively, Trade John Wall. I mean, he got so much backlash off of that. But at this point, you're looking at a point guard who, in the final year of his contract player option, we're looking at what, 40? 47.3 million dollars. In the 2022 22 Shout out Clutch season. Sports, man. That's yeah. some good agency right there. You know, if if we're even around in that time, um, that's a lot of money to pay to John Wall, who I think, I've said this before, is the worst elite point guard in the NBA. I'm not sure if that's a compliment or a knock. I, it's I, such an arbitrary distinction. I'm, right? I'm, I'm just not sure. Look, I just think John Wall's overrated. I, I think he's been... Okay, there you go. Save the middleman, get to the point. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a better take. <laughs> I just think John Wall's overrated. He's a subpar perimeter shooter. I mean, um, he's not right at highly right he, now. He, he sure. doesn't move off ball. He can be a good defender when he wants to be, except he doesn't want to be enough. Uh, he's developed a lot as a passer, and I think that should be appreciated. His perimeter shot has improved. That should be appreciated. And he's ferocious in transition, but ultimately the, the leadership is not there. The defense is not there. Comments like feeding Marcy and Gortat, that's not what you want out of a leader. <laughs> I, I just think a lot of it comes down to John Wall. I do, and I, I don't think you can trade that contract. That's part of it. Who wants to take on that money? And I think our our boss, Bill Simmons, had an interesting idea about that, right. talking about selling John Wall to Miami. For who? So it, it, Dragic? Yeah, it, it would basically be some sort of like a three-team, three-point guard switcheroo. I think Mike Conley was thrown in there as well. To who? Uh, Mike Conley to the Wizards. Uh, Dragic to... The Grizzlies. Why are the Grizzlies, Grizzlies and, doing that? And, well, I don't know. Well, if I'm we'll Miami, save, save money. I'm, if I'm Miami, I'm not sure I'm doing that either. Drive yeah, but sh- they got to do something too, though. Miami yeah. is super capped out also. They need stars. They're not going anywhere. Yeah. The team is struggling right now. I mean, they have like the quote-unquote, the uh, you know, they, get, they can get John Wall in shape at least. They have that chemistry and Miami thing going on. Yeah, at this you know, point. Give them a second start. At this point, this team is such a disaster that we're just throwing out literally anything. Do you have any ideas that involve Beal Sharks? I got one for y'all. So I'm thinking, how about Bradley Beal to the Lakers for Josh Hart, Brandon Ingram, and some cap space filler or whatever? You get Josh Hart, a, sh- a two guard who can shoot threes. You get Ingram, a young guy with all star potential. You have a new kind of team around John Wall, and so you see where it goes. I mean, if I'm the Lakers, I'm like, geez, why don't we just offer that for Kawhi Leonard or offer that for one of the Paul but that's, George? That trade isn't happening, though. I know the it's Kawhi not Leonard happening. Thing is definitely that's, happening. Beal's a great player with LeBron. He's yeah. only 25. Yeah, only I mean, 25. that's a fair trade, I think. And Beal has gotten better pretty right? much every season of his career as well. He'd be an incredible two option next to LeBron James. I think that's an impossible sell to the Lakers organization and, and fan base. I think they have. I don't know. Bradley Beal's a 25 year old all star. I mean, he's a really, really good player, and he'd be even better than he is now in Los Angeles. I don't disagree, but I, I just think the the optics in their, especially the way that the the Lakers seem to handle their business. I don't. I don't think you you give up on these specific young talents unless you're you're throwing like a Godfather deal out there. I, I don't know if I'd feel comfortable giving up Ingram. I mean, I like Ingram too, but I think Beal is just getting in his prime now. And he's like a 25-year-old all-star shooting guard. That's the kind of player I'd want for Ingram in a trade. I, I might be. I think that's a fair deal for both teams. I might be too into Ingram. I, mean, I think he's going to be really good, but LeBron is, you know, 34. And Beal's still really young too. Right. And Beal is exactly the right age where LeBron cuts off the, uh, the list of players he'd want to play with. Like, you can't be any younger than 24. That's why right now, like LeBron's going through this adjustment process. It's just like, okay, well, I got to figure out how to play with 22 year olds. And we aren't even sure how Ingram and LeBron are going to fit long term, right? Because Ingram's more of a point forward, not a great shooter. I, th- I think it kind of does work for them. It, it takes up your cap space. I just want to do it if I'm the Lakers. If I'm the Wizards, I'd be ecstatic about it. That's exactly, oh, absolutely. Yeah, put it this way like, even if it's not those names, John, it's, if it's not Brandon Ingram, it's insert other younger player but on I'm the saying, rise here. For Beal, you can get someone really good for Beal in a trade. For sure. If you can't trade John Wall. I'm not sure Beal is the guy I'd want to trade. I think he's the guy I'd want to try to keep. Unless I'm yeah, totally... but you just said you can't trade John Wall. So what are you going to do? Well, unless you can. All it takes is one desperate team. I, I wasn't sure a team would be able to trade. 
I wasn't sure the Clippers would be able to trade Blake Griffin either. And then they did. And they got a pretty solid return. They got Tobias Harris, who was good and only in his mid-20s. And they got the pick that led to Shea Gilgis Alexander. Pretty good. I mean, that's, I guess the bigger issue for me is like, how can you let Grunfeld rebuild again? This would be his <laughs> third rebuild, right? Like he built these two teams. Why let him do it again? Why, why have him blow this team up? That's for me where the big issue is, ultimately. Well, regardless of who's running the team, Wizards have a big enough fan base where I think they could afford to tank if they did go full full blow it up mode, right? I think they have a big enough market, right? Where like someday when the LA and, and New York markets are max slots are filled, maybe Washington can make themselves into a destination, which right now they don't have the cap to be a destination. And when they did have cap, they didn't even get a meeting with KD. Right. So when are what, what timeline are we looking at here? Like five years from now? <laughs> could be a long time, man. See, to me, if you have Beal, if you're going to keep Beal, I mean, he's a 25-year-old all-star. You don't have to tank at that point. You can move him around him if you want. Let's throw an outlet pass to the weekend. Friday night, we have Wolves versus Warriors. Jimmy Butler should be playing, Danny. He should be, right? Yeah, he said he would travel with the team. Yes, I believe so. All right. Well, I mean, this is as good of a test as any, right? Like, it it was what? Two and a A half years. A test of what? A, A test of, you know, where the Wolves... We know where they are. That's not, come on. Like, honestly, it was two and a half years ago when Carl Anthony Towns had, like, an incredible defensive sequence on Steph Curry. Yes. It It was was his last good defensive sequence. Yeah, (laughs) it it was, like, one of the best (laughs) games I had seen in 2016. And I was just like, holy crap. This is, this is, like, a, a symbol of something. This is, like, pointing to the future. Two and a half years later, we're like, where are we with the Wolves? We're, we're nowhere. They're, they're done. I wouldn't say that. I mean, like, not long term. I think you can clearly tell they don't like playing with Butler anymore. Like, they play with much more energy in the game against Utah and the game against Dallas where he didn't play. At this point, they got to move on because he's not going to stay anyways. And he doesn't really appear to be making them better now also. So what's the point? Right. I just want to see Carl Anthony Towns get back to that level you mentioned, Danny. And that that game against Golden State, he switched on to Stephen Curry and played magnificent defense pretty much the entire game. It was, yeah, Um, it was incredible. And yet, from there, we haven't really seen him, you know, ever really establish a, a comfort level as being that kind of first option. Like, we, we've, we've yet to really see a full season of him, other than, what, his rookie season. The when, when Levine got injured, it was like Cat and Wiggins. Yeah, the end of the, the 16-17 season, I don't have the numbers offhand, but I think off the top of my head, it's something like second half of the year, for the last 41 games, he averaged like 28 and a half points with like 13 rebounds per game with insane levels of efficiency. And, you know, it would have been nice to see that last season, but it couldn't happen because obviously Jimmy Butler was added to the right. team. And, and yeah, it, I've, I've got, I got a stat for you guys. You want to know what Carl Towns' average in the two games Jimmy Butler's missed this year is? Scoring average? 28? Yep. 31 against the Mavs, 28 against the Jazz. Like, Sometimes stuff isn't that complicated. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if, if we're going with amazing stats from this upcoming Wolves-Warriors game, we can talk about how good Steph Curry's been. You know, 33 points yeah. a game. He's on pace to average 55% from the field, 53% from three, and 91 from the free throw line. The only player who has ever finished a season 50-50-90 is his coach Steve Kerr? Hmm. Oh my goodness! And that is some that is hmm. some crazy stats right there. So 1995-96, that was the year that Steve Kerr did it. His usage rate was twelve point nine. Curry's usage rate is thirty one point three. This oh is goodness. astounding. When Stephen Curry won his first MVP, that year was just special to watch. I mean, every Warriors game was must watch TV. And there's been a little bit of Warriors fatigue after they added Kevin Durant, where it's like, yeah, this is great to watch. Even in preseason, when I was at the game um, on a Saturday night, it was like, yeah, seeing Curry and Thompson hit threes was great, but I wanted to watch Luka Doncic's debut, and I didn't get to see it. But now, with the way that's the season, a true draft hipster take, right? There. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, proud, I'm proud of you. And I was disappointed. I'm proud of you for that Luka one. played great against Beijing. Anyway. <laughs> um, with Steph and Curry, they have become must-watch TV again. Yeah. They really have with the way Steph is playing. And if Clay continues after that incredible game he had on Monday night, they are becoming a must-watch team again. And one, th- one thing I've noticed they're doing this year is they're giving Steph time with the second unit. Because last year, it was always Steph and KD. They come in, then they come out, then Clay and Draymond come with the second unit. Now Steph's playing with a bunch of reserves, and it's like, shoot how much you want, bro. It doesn't even matter. You're playing with four scrubs. <laughs> right. that's, helped, that's helped him too. Do you think Curry, I mean... Odds are he's not going to do 50, 50, 90. But if, I mean, let's just say he drops to 48% from three. He's 50, 40, 90 still. 
Can Stephen Curry win MVP this year? I think so. I don't know, man. You got Giannis in the East, the best player on the top team in the East. Like he's got less help than Steph does in Golden State. It's going to be tough no matter what he does, I think. Saturday night, John, Nuggets and Jazz play. Is this the game of the weekend? I think so. I think it's a really fun game both this season, this kind of like this Northwest Division rivalry. Like there's two young teams on the rise. I'm kind of curious, Danny, who has the better future, you think, Denver or Utah? I am a bigger fan of the Nuggets, but I also feel like the Jazz might have an easier path in terms of, you know, locking in a, you know, a Western Conference final spot and potentially, you know, scaring a team into, into the finals. It, it, it's weird with the Nuggets. You know, they, they're kind of locked in in their, their cap situation, but yet they're the fourth youngest team in the league. It's, it's a weird situation that they have, and we're not really sure if the players that they have right now are going to be the players who end up maximizing Jokic's potential or vice versa. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like the Jazz, there's a template there that makes sense. And you have a lot of wild cards. Like, what if they don't keep Rubio next year? Ultimately, it comes down to the two best young players on each team, doesn't it? Yeah. Donovan right. Mitchell and Nicole Jokic. How do those guys pan out? I think with Mitchell, you know, we've seen the flashes. We've seen what he can be. Um, the question will be with him, how does his scoring efficiency develop? Can he become an efficient scorer from each level of the floor? With Nikola Jokic, he already is everywhere on the floor. He can score from anywhere. He's an elite rebounder. He's one of the best big man passers in league history. It's about defense. And this year, so far, with their tweak system where they're hedging more instead of dropping, he's looked better. Um, I think really it comes down to those two guys. Which guy ends up reaching their peak and right now, I think Jokic is a little bit further ahead than Mitchell. Yeah, we're a, we're a pro Jokic podcast, but this game will be fun to watch. Jokic versus Gobert. Let's talk about a contrast in style at the center position. Like, are there two more different players in the league than Jokic and Gobert? No, like, utter opposites. <laughs> they are <laughs> so right. opposites. Right. Yeah, it's kind of fun. It'll be fun to watch that. Will Jokic check him out on the perimeter? Will they put Jokic on, I guess, on favors and let Millsap guard Gobert for that pick and roll defense? There's a lot of game within the game right now for those two, those two teams. It's an especially tough matchup for Jokic, too, because Gobert is perhaps the best big man defender in basketball, yeah. if not one of the best, obviously one of the best big man defenders in basketball. He'll take him on the perimeter. It's a different kind of matchup for him. Mm -hmm. Gobert is right at the rim. Jokic can play the three-point line. I don't know. I'm curious to see how it goes. It's interesting because we're looking at two teams that also have gone through some, you know, efficiency number switcheroos. Like, the Jazz have suddenly increased their pace, and now they're a probably a better offensive team than they are a defensive team early on in the season while they kind of work out, you know, the schematics of defending this league. Whereas the Nuggets have suddenly, you know, figured out who, what kind of team they want to be on defense. And they're actually, their half-court offenses looked a little sluggish uh, to Without start Will off. Barton, I think. They've been missing him. Yeah, they, they need another guy who can handle the ball and kind of create his own shot. For what it's worth, I think I'd take Utah's future over Denver. Mm -hmm. But it's close. It's really close. How about you guys? I'm, I'm Jokic all the way, so I'm going to stick with Denver. I think I'm going with the Jazz, but I'm, I'm rooting for the Nuggets. It's close. It's really close between those two teams. Either way, bright futures for both. Then on Sunday, we have Toronto going to Los Angeles to face the Lakers. Ooh. Raptors. Kawhi's homecoming. Kawhi. <laughs> <laughs> Raptors yeah. have the number three offense in basketball, the number 10 defense so far this season. John, have they done enough to show that they are the best team in the Eastern Conference? I mean, for now... I think they've been, I don't know, Milwaukee's been pretty good too, but they've been great. Like Toronto has exceeded every expectation. They've been incredible. They're so deep. They go like 11 or 12 deep. I mean, it's just, it's been fun to watch. Nurse done a very good job balancing his rotation out. Pascal Siakam's gotten a lot better this year. That's been really fun to watch him as he can kind of emerge as starting four for them. Besides Kawhi over DeRozan, like, what's different about this year's team? Well, I think Siakam. So they're not, they're not starting Ibaka and Jonas anymore. They're starting Siakam at the four. They're much more versatile. They're much, more, they're much faster. They spread the floor better. They're much more modern than they were last year with two big men. Yeah, and, and Serge Ibaka has really stepped up with some huge games this season. Uh, I, I think that's just a testament to having faith in him at the five. I think yeah, that's were, his position now. That's what that was the thing. There were He's way too many position. too many games last year where you're just like, okay, we don't need Ibaka and Valanciunas on the court at the same time. Putting him at the five seems to have turned back the clock for Ibaka. Yeah. He looks a little bit more like the Oklahoma City Ibaka, right? Yeah, coming up, you know, with the, those fun teams with KD and Russell Westbrook, 
I mean, he's been really good on both ends of the floor. And, and then him at the five lets Siakam go to the rim. He's not much of a shooter. Like those two work so much better than Jonas and Ibaka, Ibaka and Siakam. That is, I think, is as, almost as big as Kawhi DeRozan. Yeah, and, and we talk about this team being, you know, 11, 12 deep. DeLon Wright still looks pretty bad. Like he's still recovering from injury. OG has missed a couple games. Like this team isn't at full strength yet. And it's it's amazing how much better they look than last year. And a lot of it, you know, it's it's with the two guys that they brought in of course. brought in from the Spurs. <laughs> Danny Green. Amazing. Danny Green has been outstanding. Rejuvenated. Net rating God right now. And, and the Canadian dollars help him look good for him. <laughs> and and for all the, you know, understandable talk this summer about will Kawhi get back to him being himself? Will Kawhi Leonard be the same guy outside the San Antonio Spurs system? Yeah, he is. He's killing it. He is killing it. He's and I'm not even sure he's 100 percent yet. I'm yeah, not. No. I don't know if the first. I mean, they're still resting him, right? He's yes, missed like two or three games already. Exactly. He his he he missed the Monday day, Monday game against the Bucks, which is a shame because Giannis missed it too. Um, and he missed a game earlier this month against the Wizards, which they won. Uh, their, their only loss was that Monday game against the Bucks. Other than that, they are undefeated with Kawhi Leonard. Um, look, man, like I don't think his first step is quite where it was yet. Um, he's getting closer. I think he's improved since preseason when when we first saw him get out on the court. But this guy. He scores from everywhere. His defense is still elite. Did you see that play earlier this week when he was just diving for the ball without looking? Like his yep. instincts, his are instincts are unreal. Out of this world. He's rebounding. He's passing. He does it all. He's looking like an MVP favorite. And that's the thing too. It's like because he's ma- worked on his game so much, even off the great first step right now, he's still dominating. He's so fundamentally sound. Like Kawhi is just great at everything. It's really, really impressive. Right. Like stylistically, when I'm watching him, I'm seeing basically a 33 year old Kobe. Is essentially oh, that's, what a, that's a compliment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I like that. Yeah. So basically, like we're looking at a Kobe who this. Are you saying like 33 co- year old Kobe with Scottie Pippen's defense? Is that where you're going? I mean, yeah, and yeah. that guy should probably be the MVP. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to be a tight race. and then man, the, oh. I just got to see Kawhi versus Giannis, man. Those two guys, they got to play one-on-one in a series. We will, that would just be so incredible. We will get to see Kawhi versus LeBron James, though. Okay. We yeah. will get to see that. I think it's perhaps the stiffest test of the season so far for the Lakers. They face Portland on Saturday night ahead of Sunday's game against Toronto. So it's a back-to-back, and they're in Portland going back home on Sunday. That's a really tough back-to-back for right. them. So. Granted, Toronto's on the road. That's tough for the Lakers. And they've looked really shaky defensively still, even in their wins um, against Dallas on Wednesday night. They squeaked that one out. They squeaked yeah. it out. Yeah, that's a game where going into the season, you would think they should handle business, but they didn't, and they haven't all season long. I think the Lakers are going to be fine because they have LeBron James <laughs> on their team. <laughs> but Sunday night against the Toronto Raptors, that game for them, I think, will really be a good barometer of where they're at against the elite of the elite because Toronto is up there right now. Absolutely. It's time for draft class, guys. Throwback. I'm excited, man. Ooh, it's back. To last season. We're going to do a little segment here because college basketball season starts on Tuesday, November 6th, also Election Day. Make sure you vote. And really, it's Duke season. It is Duke Duke season. season That's it. Duke is going to be the talk of the season from an NBA perspective. Um, In college basketball, they are ranked 11th heading into the season. Perhaps they rise up the rankings over the course of the year. But for NBA draft purposes, Zion Williamson, top pick in the draft, forward center, R.J. Barrett, a playmaking forward wing, and then Cam Reddish, a scoring wing. Those three guys could end up being the top three picks in the draft, John. Yeah, I mean, it's really exciting. I did an article uh, this week about for our college basketball preview talking about that. Like, this is three six foot seven wings who can get their own shot. It's almost like if you had Jabari, Ingram, and Tatum on the same team in college. <laughs> I mean, it really just speaks to how much of a coup this was for Coach K and this truly legendary recruiting class. Point guard Trey Jones as well, who is not going to be a top five pick, right. but he could be a mid-lottery, mid-lottery pick, a mid-first round draft pick. Younger brother of Tyus Jones, yeah, of course. And, uh, and Joey Walker, right? He was like a... Baker. Ba- Joey, Joey Baker. Baker. I'm sorry, I, I didn't even know. Like he, they, they basically had to shoehorn him into this uh, SI cover shoot <laughs> to fit. So the, the headline of the, the cover was Fabist Five, and I'm pretty sure they just had to put in Baker <laughs> just to make it work. Yeah, I feel like it's more of a Fantastic Four than, yeah, right? than a Fab Five, but I don't know. Danny, who's the best prospect on that Duke team? I think it's R.J. Barrett. I think he's the safest prospect of the three. 
And I think you it's just so easy to project his success. He's smart, playmaking, strong, athletic wing who has all the physicality in the world. You don't, you don't know if he's necessarily going to be shooting it all that well, but that's something we can He shot monitor. okay in the preseason season. He didn't shoot badly. Right. Do you agree with that, John? RJ Barrett's best prospect? I don't know. Three? I go back and forth all the time. I could honestly see any of those three guys being the best prospect. What's the argument I for think, Reddish? I mean, he's the best shooter. Who's going to be the best shooter of those three is Cameron Reddish, right? If the NBA is a three-point shooting league, mm-hmm. which guy could make 10 threes in a game? It's Reddish. Yeah. He's six foot eight. He ran point in high school. He's pretty athletic. He's got the body. He's got the game. I was talking with my, my old boss, Eric Weiss, yesterday, and we were just chatting about the RJ versus Zion debate that could end up occurring in NBA draft circles, right? But we might talk about it at some point over the course of the season. And we definitely will. We oh, will. Yeah, we'll you know, have a lot of Duke talk. Right? And, and with Zion, you know, heading into those, those exhibition games, it's like we know there's more than just dunking. Um, but actually seeing it in live competition, hmm. That guy can play make. He can take the ball coast to coast. He's an elite rebounder who can go coast to coast. There's a little bit, a little bit of Charles Barkley there. There's a little bit of a more athletic Blake Griffin. There's a little bit of. I mean, like, it's crazy how athletic he is. Yeah, his size. It's it's insane. It really is insane. There's like a best case version of Julius Randle in there. There's Charles Barkley is. Let's not underplay that. There is some Barkley in his game with his size at only six foot six, with his elite rebounding ability, with his athleticism, with his ball handling. He can score inside. He can handle the ball. This dude is a wing, but he's plays a center's game. And I think in today's positionless league, like you mentioned, RJ Barrett, will he be able to shoot with Cam Reddish? The question is going to be about like, you know, consistency, intensity. Yep. So his defense with Williamson, like that guy can defend multiple positions. He can handle the ball as a big. And because he's really a center in, within your offense, he doesn't need to be a 38% three-point shooter. He can be 34, 35% and be fine. I think Zion could end up being the best of the three. He's probably a five, right? The way the league is now. I'd say so. Pounds. I'd say so. Yeah. yeah. Just say, for, let's put him at the five, whatever. I, it's, it's funny because all of the, the comparisons that we had for Miles Bridges last year kind of go double for Zion. It's as if, you know, He's got 60 pounds of Miles yeah. Bridges, man. Like, imagine <laughs> if Charles Barkley ate Larry Johnson. Like, that's my, that's my, <laughs> yeah. that's my yeah. comparison for Zion, pretty much. <laughs> he's, he's a freak of nature. With Zion, what are you looking for, Danny, heading into the season for him to become that clear-cut number one guy on your personal board? I mean, this seems really niche, but I would love to see him become a better free throw shooter because he is going to live at the line. There's no yeah, way you're, sure. there's no way you're going to be able to get him out of the lane without fouling. And so, you know, over the course of his high school career, he was shooting in the 60s, which is like fine for a center, I guess, but like if you're going to be this playmaking, you know, guy who can basically do anything, you know, off short rolls and everything, he's going to get hacked so much. It would be amazing to see him shoot in the 70s. Yeah, I think for me, though, it's defense. Like, if Zion's going to play a five, can he anchor a defense, right? Can he, like, make the right reads? How does it in the pick and roll? That, to me, is the question, because if we want to maximize Zion, we got to play him at the five. If he's going to play at the five, an NBA coach has to trust him being the quarterback of his defense. And that's what I want to say this season. I'm with you there. I think with the with the shooting ability from the free throw line and the three-point shooting, like I look at that almost as the cherry on top, right? If if he can become an elite defender that can anchor a defense who can switch and defend guards and wings as well as he defends bigs because of his length and his just, I mean, he is so strong. Yeah. He is so wide. Um, okay, I mean, I got. is he the best combination of size and speed since LeBron? Is that like crazy to say? When you factor in speed, yes. I think if it's like size and athleticism, Blake Griffin would be right there too. But I'm saying at 285 yeah. pounds. Though. Oh, I yeah. Like those guys I, I don't think there's 285. Yeah. He, he's the Hulk. You know, there there are certain bigs in the league, and, and the NBA has such great athletes, but there are bigs whose athleticism just seems beyond what should be possible. Like, every time I watch Andre Drummond dunk, I'm just like, there's no way someone who's like 270, <laughs> 290 should be able to lift maybe, off maybe the air 200. like that. <laughs> yeah. And yet, I'm like watching Zion, and I'm like, dude, he makes Drummond look like Jonas Valanciunas. Whew. Yeah, I'm just curious to see, like, how valuable is that much weight in the basketball court? Right, 285 pounds is just such an outlier. Now, like, can you change the game with that size, with that kind of just raw strength? Or is that kind of got diminishing returns at that size? That's what I'm curious I, to see. I really think he can, man. I really do. Because when you think about it, he has not, he 
speed is not an issue with him. It's right. not like he doesn't. His move first well. step is it's extraordinary. Lazy. It's not like he doesn't have a great first step. It's not like he doesn't rebound well. It's not like fatigue is an issue. None of that so far seems to be problematic for him. Um, so if he is able to anchor a defense and at least be average as a shooter um, and continue playmaking as well as he did in the exhibition games, well, I could see him rising up to the number one spot. Because The other thing is length, though, too. Yeah. He only had a 6'10 wingspan, and we'll have to see how that plays. Because, yes. like, will he get in foul trouble a lot jumping for... Like, if I'm going against Zion, I'm pump faking him every time because I can't jump with him, obviously, <laughs> right? And that's where it ultimately could just fall back on R.J. Barrett, a guy who, besides his shot, which is not a, even a weakness, it's a average shot that could potentially yeah. be good. It's We're like, not looking at Ben Simmons here. Yes. Um, with R.J. Barrett, there's really no weaknesses in this game. He has size. He defends. He's a competitor. I mean, he plays hard. There's mm-hmm. leadership there. Everything I've heard about him off the court with how much he trains and how much Canada has invested in him with player development. I mean, he has everything you need to reach his full potential, whatever that may be. RJ is a guy that I think will end up probably number one on my board. I think Zion could. Super safe. He yeah. could. But I think RJ Barrett, with the fact that he's a little bit safer but still has that elite upside— to me, he's the the number one prospect now heading into the season and probably will be exiting it as well. Yeah. I will say, though, I think don't undersell Reddish because, like, which which one of those players would make most sense in Golden State, right? It's Cam Reddish. Like, if I can, if I can get one player who's going to be a volume three-point shooter and everything else, I think that does give him a lane to be the best player in this draft down the road. The question with him, so I was at the Hoop Summit uh, last April, and they, I read the Hoop Summit, they have a scrimmage where, like, the best players... They play like a bunch of local college kids. And Reddish, I've never seen a guy not sweat for an hour of basketball and score like 30 <laughs> points. Like, I was incredible. He was not sweating. That's part of the problem. Like, that though. man scores. That is the problem. But that man does score incredibly easily. <laughs> yeah, his scoring is very, very easy. It comes easy for him. I think scoring is the type of thing where that's never going to be a problem. It's about the consistency factor. Right. How much is he engaged on offense where you don't need to just funnel the ball to him? He takes it and makes it happen himself. Defense, how much is he going to be always focused on the end of the floor? Because, That's what I yeah, because he has the ability to defend. You know, look at his build. It's like he can defend four positions. He, he has a perfect body um, for today's league. Six, seven, six, eight, seven foot one or so wingspan. I think span. he's like 220. I mean, he's a big yeah, boy. he's a big yeah. guy. And, you know, we were talking earlier about how he played, pretty much played point guard in high school. He had nine assists in, a, in an exhibition game the other day. He can play make. Absolutely. The, the, the ability is there. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't underestimate Reddish either, John. For what it's worth, I just if I'm if you're ranking those three guys, where do you have them right now, Danny? I would do it: Barrett, Zion, Reddish. You, John? I, I'll go. I'll go Zion, Reddish, Barrett. Keep it interesting. I mean, who knows? It's the, we don't know enough right now to rank these guys. And it, it's interesting because if Reddish does get buried, like he could very well be like a Devin Booker All Star, a guy who you know kind of recedes into the mm. background and then ends up being the perfect NBA player for the modern time. Some of those questions were there about Tatum, right, in college. So mm-hmm. is, is he going to defend? Can he do these other things besides score? And maybe, look, a lot of it depends on the situation. If Tatum didn't end up in Boston, we might not, might not look at him the same way we do now. Um, for Cameron, Cameron Reddish, where he lands in the NBA will play a significant difference in the way he is really the way he's developed, I think his situation plays such an important role in success. And it's, for sure, it's too for early sure. for this. Like these guys haven't played <laughs> the college season yet. That starts next Tuesday. However, um, when it comes to assessing these guys, situation matters. And you're right; he could take a back seat behind Zion and RJ Barrett, where we don't get to see everything from him. Or maybe, or maybe that could help him. Maybe, 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 maybe he just would, averages nine assists per game. You know, maybe he's asked more to play make. Maybe he's right. asked more to play defense, and we get to see those areas of his game. And speaking of the college season, I mean, this will be the best game to watch them all play is the first game of the year. Yeah. They're playing Kentucky. Yes. Kentucky's loaded as usual. This is going to be an incredible draft hipster draft class game for us to all break down. I can't wait for that Re- one. Really quick, John, who's the one guy to watch in Kentucky? Uh, probably Keldon Johnson. He's like a six 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 seven do it all wing. He's by far their best prospect. But they're they're loaded, man. They have plenty of NBA prospects up and on that roster. PJ Washington, I like him. Yeah, he's good too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Him versus Zion will be really yeah, fun. Oh, I'm excited for that. Well, that was cool, guys. That's all we have time for today. Danny, John, looking forward to next Friday. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. And thank you for listening to The Corner 3. Please give us a five-star rating on iTunes and tell your friends, tell your family about the show. Make us super, super happy if you do that. Special shout-out to Bobby Wagner for producing the podcast and to my good friend Elon for listening to the show. Thank you again for listening. We'll be back next Friday. Have a good weekend.
Hey guys, Liz Kelly here. The Big Picture with our editor-in-chief Sean Fennessy officially has its own feed and is expanding its coverage to give listeners everything from Oscar buzz to interviews with actors and directors like Jonah Hill and Ethan Hawke. You can get ready for award season with expert Oscar analysis, box office results, and all things movies. Sean will sit down with Hollywood's biggest filmmakers, break down the latest industry trends, and review new films with other Ringer colleagues like Shea Serrano, Amanda Dobbins, and Bill Simmons. Make sure you listen and subscribe to The Big Picture on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.